From the land of lakes, this is 10,000 Takes. Brought to you by Minnesota Score Radio. Wally and Eric back for yet another week as we slice and dice the always busy, always topical, super saturated Minnesota sports scene. Yes, indeed. Another episode of 10K Takes Television. Uh, we will start with your Minnesota Twins, who this week have been on uh, a gauntlet of a road trip. Yeah. Tampa Bay and Toronto, a couple of beasts from the east. And uh, I, I know you think it's maybe a, a bit of a defining trip. I do think that, and I noticed that uh, Byron Buxton is once again not with the squad on the uh, disabled list. I, yeah. I mean, man, I tell you. And I know he got hit by a pitch, and that does not tickle. In the rib area. In the ribs. Um, but, man, if, if there's anything that can go wrong, it does with Byron. Well, and, and that blows up the experiment of, hey, if we only DH Byron, we can keep him on the of field. Course. This happened at the plate, as of you course. said, hit by a, a pitch ball against Cleveland, your team. And Sorry. So <laughs> I, I say put him out in center field. I, I just I agree. You can't be timid and you can't be walking on hot coals all your life. Yeah. You just got to live. Speaking of hot coals, do you think that Derek Falvey and Thad Levine are on hot coals for trading Luis Arise away? Oh, my goodness, the guy is going to be chasing Ted Williams here. He might hit 400. He's right there. Yeah, this is really remarkable what Luis Arise is doing. Now, they knew they were dealing away the reigning AL batting champion. Now, his average last year was, what, 317? It wasn't that right. high. He nudged out Aaron Judge, cost him the triple crown. But he's been scorching hot. He, he's Miami Heat. With apologies to Jimmy Butler and the basketball team. Right. He, they can't cool the guy off. And if he flirts with 400, does not look good for the Twins. Bad optics. Yeah. It's going to go down as maybe <laughs> one of the top 10 bad moves in Minnesota sports history. Yes. Why don't we visit that right now? Yes, we're calling it Minnesota Sports Goofs. You and I did some extensive preparation and research. It was hard to whittle down this list of oh, 10 boy. or 11. Yeah. So we're going to probably miss a few, but we'll start by uh, you know just ping-ponging our, uh, our ideas back and forth. You can go first. Well, this one is the easiest one yeah. of all time. <laughs> it's the worst trade maybe in sports history. Look it up. Google it if you don't believe me. A lot of writers and pundits think that's the case. Of course, I'm talking about the trade of Herschel Walker back in 1989 from the Dallas Cowboys to the Minnesota Vikings, and they gave up a boatload of draft picks that turned the Dallas Cowboys into world champions a handful of yeah, times. Three rings. Three rings. Dallas, a three-ring circus, yep. if you will. I, no doubt about it. Well, that's high on my list. Yeah. But number one for me, uh, the Minnesota Vikings moving into the Metrodome. <laughs> it's number two on my then list. And so. going to U.S. Bank Stadium. Yeah. They had a chance to get it right and go back into the elements. Instead, they go to another dome. I just think it ruined the mystique of the franchise. They haven't been back to a Super Bowl since, and they aren't the same franchise in my eyes. They're just not the same when they're inside. Yeah. Um, well, since I had Herschel so close to the top, I think that the new Herschel Walker trade belongs there as well, <laughs> and that would be the trade for Rudy Gobert uh, from, Minnesota, from Utah to Minnesota for a handful of players and a boatload of draft picks. I mean, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, the Rudy G uh, trade has the potential to be maybe even worse than Herschel Walker. We'll see. Time will tell. But it was a blockbuster that last year netted very little dividends for the Minnesota yeah. Timberwolves. And I have that on my list as well. In fact, I have a number of Timberwolf <laughs> goofs that I've uh, singled out. You know, bypassing Steph Curry in the draft. Yeah. The Joe Smith fiasco. That's on my list. It, it crippled the team for five years. Jimmy Butler yeah. not figuring that out after making a big deal and all the hype and hoopla about bringing him here. So the T-Wolves, boy, there's a a lot of ammunition there. I'll, I'll throw two more in on the Timberwolves <laughs> since we're talking Timberwolves. Trading Kevin Garnett to the Celtics. Yeah. That just never panned out. And, of course, KG went on to win a, a, a NBA title with the Celtics. I believe that was 2007. He won the NBA title. And then one more uh, Timberwolves won the firing of Dwayne Casey when he had the club at 500, and they never went beyond 500 again until, well, I believe it was when Tip 
Woods got yes. him over the hump and got him into the playoffs. That was a, a dumb decision yeah. by the Minnesota Timberwolves. Uh, well, I'll throw some out at you. How about the Minnesota Gophers failing back in the late 1980s to put a Notre Dame out clause in Lou Holtz's contract? In other words, you're stuck here in Minneapolis. You can't go to Notre yeah, Dame. But one. they gave him the out, and really, since then, can you remember Gopher football garnering that much enthusiasm? No, 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 not it. And Lou Holtz had him on a Rose Bowl track. Not even close. Um, I'm going to go back to baseball. Uh, the Rod Carew trade to the Angels, I, that was devastating. If you were in the Twin Cities back then, and then he went on to win a batting yeah. title or two there and and had a you know a great finish to his career with the Angels, but that was devastating when Calvin traded him. Catastrophic, up. and it was self-inflicted. Calvin made unfortunate comments at a speech in Wasika. They were racial by nature. They took his statue down because of it. Now, Rod Carew made up with Calvin. He, they were good at the right. end, but that's the reason he wanted to go to Orange County. And I'll throw in David Ortiz. The Minnesota Twins say, Ooh. David, we don't need you. Boston picks him up. He's taking BP at Fenway, and he's trying to spray the ball all over the park. And the Red Sox says, what are you doing? And the Twins uh, apparently told David, hey, hit to all fields. Oh, and the boy. Red Sox said, no, just hit it over that wall. Yeah. And he went to the Hall of Fame. One more Twins goof that I'm going to throw at you. Okay. They should not have fired Paul Molitor. I'm not saying Rocco is doing a bad job, but I think Paul Molitor was a good manager that they just gave up on way too quickly. Can I throw another Twins one in? Sure, why not? Not giving Torrey Hunter the five-year oh, contract yeah. he wanted. He, they only offered three for $45 million. The, the compensation was good. The length wasn't. Torrey went to the Angels. The Twins regretted that move so much, they brought him back. <laughs> yes, they did. Uh, there are plenty more, and we'll do this again, by the And way. I have one more quick one All to right. duck in. The Minnesota North Stars should have left their name and colors here so the Wild could have been the North Stars oh, yeah. and had those colors. And now we got that dopey name and dopey <laughs> logo. All right, a lot more coming up. We're going to throw some punches with Caleb Truax here on 10K Takes, your Minnesota sports goof ticket. <laughs> I've been meaning to give you these for many years. I think they're perfect. It isn't just about vision, it's about care. Nobody cares for eyes more than Pearl. Ten thousand takes rolls along. Time to talk some boxing, and our friend and my former broadcasting partner, Caleb Truex, is going to climb back into the ring, and he joins us now. Caleb, uh, at the age of 39, after two years plus off from being in the ring, um, what motivates you to climb back between the ropes uh, later on this month? Well, I still love boxing, and uh, even though I've been off for two years, or two and a half years, I I've been training every day, and I... Had a few fights uh, fall through in that time. I was supposed to go over to Germany a couple times, and that uh, COVID put a nix on that, and and thought I was going to be fighting a while back at the Armory, and uh, just haven't been able to get anything scheduled. I never uh, retired or anything like that. I just was uh, unable to to book a fight. So here we are, uh, two and a half years later, and uh, I'm ready to roll. What do you know about your opponent, Burley Brooks, out of Dallas? He's only fought nine times. He is, I think he's 6-2-1. and one. What can you tell us about this yes. guy? Well, up until uh, this past Thursday or Friday, I, I had never heard of him. Um, apparently, <laughs> he uh, was uh, a, a real, real highly regarded prospect on PVC's uh, roster and suffered a defeat, uh, his first loss, and then suffered a second loss, which, which I think shouldn't have been a loss. I watched the film. I, I thought he won the fight pretty clearly. Uh, and then he fought that same guy and got a draw. So uh, there's some video of him out here, uh, out there. He's pretty, pretty long, pretty lanky, younger than me. Obviously, everybody's going to be younger than me. So, <laughs> so that, they all got that advantage on me. But uh, uh, obviously, not as experienced. He's only got nine fights. He's never fought anyone the caliber that that uh, I'm at. And uh, I'll have to use those things to my advantage. You know, just uh, uh, experience and. Uh, and the, the strength of competition that I fought. Well, since you brought it up, 
um, at the age of 39. Uh, how much longer? Are there certain goals you want to reach uh, before you hang it up for good? Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd love to fight for a title again. You know, obviously this is the first step in, in making one last run. Uh, I got to get past Burley Brooks, and I'm not looking past him. Uh, I need to, to take care of business on the 24th and, and get the job done and do so impressively just to, to let everyone know that I still have it. And uh, I'd like to uh, bring a big fight back to the Armory. Um, you know, I, I've made it pretty clear that I want to finish my career uh, here in Minnesota in front of my fans and uh, at the Armory and the beautiful venue that it is. And I just uh, want to go out on a high note, go out with a bang. And, you know, I, I, I realize I don't have very, very much time left in boxing, uh, a few fights maybe, and it's a young man's sport, but uh, I want to go out on my terms and, and uh, want to finish it up here at home. So you're part of a card that will take place on June 24th, as you said, at the Armory, downtown Minneapolis. It's gained a great reputation as a boxing venue. Your third fight at the Armory. What does that mean to you to, to be there, you know, battling Burley Brooks? But also, over the years, you've helped put this uh, arena on the map. Yeah, it's, uh, I think it's one of the premier boxing venues in the, in the whole country. Uh, if not the premier venue uh, in the country, uh, as far as uh, size goes, um, you know, that, that mid-level, uh, it's not a big arena, it's more intimate, uh, great sight lines. Uh, just a fantastic place to fight. The, the crowds are, have been fantastic lately. Uh, you know, we're going to pack the place again on June 24th. And just, I just love fighting at home. You know, uh, a lot of guys uh, say that they don't like fighting at home because there's more pressure, more distractions. I love it. Uh, you know, most of my fights have been here in Minnesota. I grew up on the on the circuit here, um, fighting since 2006 or 2007, excuse me. And uh, all my fans get to drive 15 minutes, come check me out, and then we get to go somewhere else after and uh, have a good time and celebrate a win, hopefully on uh, the 24th. And while Eric makes a good point, you helped um, you know bring popularity to this venue, which, as you said, is an extraordinary venue for boxing. Uh, I also think that you have been part of the revolution in keeping boxing in the forefront. Let's face it. I mean, it, it's as a sport, it's had its ups and downs. But in Minnesota, you know, you and Jamal James have really given it, um, you know, a boost. As you look at it now, what kinds of things do you hope to do post-career to keep that going and to keep the sport of boxing, you know, at the forefront here in Minnesota? Yeah, I'd love to stay involved in the sport, you know, calling fights like like we did uh, the Showtime International broadcast back in February. That uh, that was fun. I would love to to continue to do that. And uh, obviously, there's only so many of those jobs around, so it's uh, <laughs> tough to uh, to do that full time. But I'd like to stay involved in boxing uh, in that aspect. I will always be in the gyms, uh, even when I retire. I'll be in the gyms helping out kids. I love helping out kids and and just seeing amateurs uh, flourish. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to get involved in the Golden Gloves when I retire. Uh, all the all the uh, Cindy Schumacher and Lisa Bach, all, all those uh, guys that are so integral in the in the Golden Gloves here in Minnesota, they always give me a hard time and try to get me to uh, to get involved now, but I don't have the time for it while I'm still while I'm still training and still fighting. So when I when I retire, I'll, I'll get involved in the Golden Gloves and and just try to uh, make boxing as healthy as possible here in Minnesota. Certainly boxing has been very lucrative for you. It's opened up a lot of doors. When you talk to these young kids about the sport, do you keep it real though? Because it is a tough sport and it requires, you know, a lot of sweat equity and there's a risk involved, isn't there? I always keep it real uh, when it comes to uh, projecting someone's future in the sport. You know, most people aren't going to be uh, world champions. Uh, hardly any are going to be world champions. Most people won't even be successful pros. And I tell guys that all the time, you know, if you're in it to try to make money and try to be a world champion, chances are it's not going to happen. Uh, just like you would say to a, a kid that uh, wants to be in the NBA, chances are it's not going to happen. But if you are doing it because you love the sport, you're doing it, uh, you know, to stay healthy or, or to, to compete uh, and you continue to progress, then we have something there, you know, and I, and I let guys know that all the time, you know, if you're chasing money, you're chasing the glory of, of being a successful fighter, 
it's not going to end out pretty for you. Boxing is your vocation. It's how you make your money. Um, but I know you have a love for the game of baseball. And you and I have talked about <laughs> this in the past. Um, give me the, the genesis of that, how that all became and uh, where you are with baseball right now, particularly this team that can't win a playoff game that's uh, located right here in the Twin Cities. Yeah. Well, we're, 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 right before we got on, I saw a place on uh, the injured list again, so we don't want to talk about that right now. <laughs> but, uh, uh, no, I love baseball. I, I tell everybody it's still my, my favorite sport, and I tell my coach, Tom Hall, said all the time, if, if I would have had a coach that was as good as him and knowledgeable as him in baseball, I'd probably have been playing pro baseball instead of uh, instead of boxing. But uh, I uh, – First sport I learned how to play when I was young was golf because my, my family uh, were all golfers. My mom was a great golfer. My grandfather was a, a golf coach. My uncle was a great golfer. But I learned how to play golf first and then came baseball. And uh, it's just been a love of mine since uh, since I was a young kid. And Kirby Puckett was my, my hero growing up. And, and uh, you know, I've been to hundreds of Twins games over the years. Back when it was affordable, you could get an upper deck right field and uh, for five right. bucks back in the day. <laughs> but... Uh, um, no, I, I just love the sport. I, I, I listen to it on the radio or else watch the Twins pretty much every night during the summer. I, I'm trying to trying to get my boy uh, Cam to, uh, to to pick up the sport, although he, he, he would just rather fight dinosaurs and, and uh, <laughs> have battles with King Kong and Godzilla right now. But uh, we're working on hitting, hitting off a tee this summer. <laughs> <laughs> if you were to pick a current member of the Minnesota Twins, and put them in the ring uh -oh. and say, okay, this is one guy I could see making that transition to boxing. Is there anybody on that roster you'd choose? Oh, man. Um, well, Buxton is, Buxton's uh, like a ultra athlete, but uh, he gets hurt too much, so I don't think he can really? handle the, the, uh, <laughs> the rigors of boxing. Um, let me see. Uh, um, Royce Lewis? He's an athlete, yeah. He's an athlete, but he gets hurt all the time too. <laughs> Although he did, he took that, he took that, he took that tumble uh, a couple of nights ago pretty well. So he's got a good, he's got a good chin on him. He busted his face right on the ground and popped right back up and didn't get hurt. So, um, I mean, let me think. I would, I would have said uh, Miguel Sano. He would have been a big heavyweight, but uh, he's not with the Twins anymore. Wow. And uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. I've never thought about that before. <laughs> Boy, that'd have to be a super heavyweight division if Miguel was in there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, Caleb, we appreciate you spending some time with us. Good luck on the 24th, and uh, hopefully we'll have another one of these discussions in the not-too-distant future. Yeah, thanks. Before I leave, i got to give my boy Tito Trinidad in the picture here. Tito Trinidad was my favorite my favorite fighter, and this is my puppy. He's uh, a purebred bull terrier, and he's been breathing. That's not me breathing heavy. I'm in good shape for my fight. So if you've been hearing the breathing, it's him. <laughs> Perfect. Awesome. <laughs> Getting ready for a target spot. <laughs> All right. Thanks, yeah, Caleb. That's right. Thanks, guys. All right. He is Caleb Truex, the former super middleweight champion of the world, right here on 10,000 Takes. Stay with us. We're back with more after this. I've been meaning to give you these for many years. I think they're It isn't just about vision, it's about care. Nobody cares for eyes more than Pearl. And we continue along here on 10,000 Takes. As you know, I spent some time in uh, West Africa uh, in mid-May as I'm part of a, a uh, operation trying to get baseball and a field in particular mm -hmm. done in Benin, West Africa. Um, so I wanted to give folks who watch our show a little closer look at what we're doing there and how we are coming very, very close now to building the very first baseball field in that small West African nation. Daily life in this small West African nation looks a lot like this. Locals selling their wares out in front of makeshift storefronts that double as their home. And for many of the kids who are playing baseball, they have to navigate these busy streets by foot, some of them taking up to two hours to walk to and from practice. 
There are no actual baseball fields in Benin, but there are plenty of baseball players. Upwards of 200 players by last count, many of whom are now practicing and playing on this ad hoc schoolyard surface that is mostly used for soccer. Our trip to Benin in mid-May was to find a spot where we could put up a backstop or two and create something that resembles an actual baseball field. Well, it's been at least seven years since the effort to put a real baseball field here in Benin has been going on. Now, with a lot of work and a lot of extra effort, it looks like that dream will finally come true. Besides the usual red tape of getting permission to work on this property and build a field here, there are people in difficult circumstances who live in the adjoining neighborhood. So when it rains too much, all this neighborhood is a party. So when uh, the, the water goes up, then all this neighborhood is a party. So it's basically it's underwater. underwater. It's I mean, underwater. I mean, you can see the water now. Now, you see, you, as, like you can see, just right now. These neighbors you see right here, they are really poor. Nobody cares about them. So will be baseball will be the opportunity for them to go to school. Yeah. Very poor neighborhood. Yeah. Very, very poor neighborhood. Nobody cares about them. But despite being on the edge of a struggling neighborhood and not having an ideal surface to play on, this schoolyard slash soccer field is now scheduled to soon become this country's very first baseball field. I think that if you have a good baseball field here, it can help us to play more, to play more game and have to experience uh, how to play in real baseball field, and that after we can compete in other field without problem. So we theoretically. Instead of having these kids play soccer, if we were upgrading it, we could have them play baseball, right? Yeah, that the kids living uh, in the neighborhood that can come over here. If, for example, we put up a backstop there, they're going to be interested in the game, and they're going to come out. They don't want to know more about the game, and they're going to sign up for the team, and they're going to play baseball. Come on, come on, come on. Reporting from Benin, West Africa, I'm Wally Langfellow for 10,000 Takes. That's good. Well, as they once said in the movie Field of Dreams, if you build it, they will come. Hopefully that's going to be the case over there in Benin, West Africa. Yeah, and an impoverished nation, you know, they don't have much. The kids don't have much, but I think that they see it as a way out. You know, this is something for them to strive for. It gives the kids something to yep. do, you know, and um, all those pieces are important. And it was it's really good to see it up close like I was able to. And I've been over there three times now, but I think that uh, that piece of it is what drives it. That it gives them something beyond soccer, really, because sure. it's the only sport yep. that they really well, care about. Kudos over. for your effort. Yeah, thanks, sir. All right, we will be back now with takes of the day coming up next. You are watching 10,000 takes. Stay with us. I've been meaning to give you these for many years. I think they're perfect. <laughs> It isn't just about vision, it's about care. Nobody cares for eyes more than Pearl. K takes on television. Wow, what an episode. We've gone inside the boxing ring with Caleb Truax. Mm -hmm. We've uh, hopped the pond, gone to Africa, <laughs> seen your efforts over there in Benin. Uh, we listed all the great Minnesota sports goofs, and oh we boy. could still do another segment on that. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> but we have to get into... Uh, Saudi 54 and the PGA Tour and the European Tour as well, all hopping in bed together. And oh, by the way, my nomination for Hypocrite of the Year, PGA Commissioner Jay Monahan. I think he wins it hands down. Yeah, well, and, and all of them together, it just makes you realize that this isn't about the game of golf. This isn't about you as a fan. It's about the money, baby. That's all they care about. And, you know, it's just like any other sport. So get get used to it. Um, but I will say this. 
I think that this may have a positive effect for the 3M tournament, which of course is played here in the Twin Cities on an annual basis, um, because with LIV and the fact that the 3M is right after the British Open, you know, they've struggled to get some of the big names to come to Minnesota to play in the tournament. So hopefully this will you know, counter that, and they'll have some more big names like a Brooks Kepka maybe come and play. Not this year. That's not going to happen this year. But I'd say next year might be a boost. Could be. Uh, this story certainly was a tsunami earlier in the week. I mean, it just garnered a ton of attention. And one thing I, I did read, Jack Nicholas, who actually thinks this is good for golf. He says, whatever's good for the sport, I'm in favor of. But apparently, Saudi 54 offered him $100 million wow. to make that pivot. And he said, no, I can't leave the tour. I started the PGA to her, so at least the Golden Bear stuck to his guns, as did Tiger Woods. Yeah. Well, yeah, Tiger never left. No. Tiger never left. Okay. Um, I am told it is time for takes of the day. Yeah, we're going to find out what your mood is. Are you an angry American, an optimistic Ohioan, or, as usual, a grumpy guardian? <laughs> Well, interesting that you say uh, oh, guardian with this one. Yeah, you know where this one's going. Uh, so over the weekend, this past weekend, I ventured into Target to pick up a few items. And there, behold, was a pack of uh, Topps baseball cards. I figured, oh, what the heck? I haven't bought a pack of baseball cards in a long time. So I picked it up, brought it home, opened up the package right on top. Uh, current Cleveland DH slash first baseman slash outfielder Josh Naylor. Oh, this is kind of fun. I turn the card over and I start reading, you know, how they list all the teams that he's played for and so on. And uh, 2022, he plays for the Guardians. 2021, it says Cleveland. 2020, it says Cleveland. 2019, it says San Diego Pod. It says Padres. I'm thinking, oh, wait a minute. He played for the Indians. They're, they're <laughs> listing nicknames except for Cleveland. I thought, well, whatever. So I start paging through the rest of the cards, and I run across Josh Donaldson, former Minnesota Twin. On the back of his card, it says Blue Jays and Athletics and Twins and Cleveland. <laughs> now, wait a minute here. And then after that, it says Braves. So riddle me this, Batman, Tops Card Company. You can say Braves, but you can't say Indians. The fact of the matter is... And we're just talking facts here that Josh Donaldson and anybody who played for the Cleveland baseball team prior to 2022 played for the Cleveland Indians. They did not play for the Cleveland baseball team or the Cleveland baseball club. They played for the Cleveland Indians. You cannot change that fact. You can try and airbrush it, but you cannot change the fact that they played for the Cleveland Indians. Come on, Tops, you're better than this. And the mood meter says, Grumpy Guardian. Not, grump, not Grumpy and, Cleveland Baseball Club? No, and uh, if I could add something, you, you, you're now the anti-woke warrior. <laughs> <laughs> you should move to Florida. Oh, <laughs> He's boy. on a rant, folks. All right, All right well, I will uh, go on my own rant. Okay. Earlier uh, in the week, the Buffalo Bills broke ground for their new $1.54 billion stadium that will open up in a few years. It's long overdue. The Bills uh, need a new play pen. They're going to get one. But here's the great news. They're staying in the NF elements. No roof, no retractable roof. Open air. There's going to be snow. There's going to be rain. There's going to be games in the heat. And how about this for a novel idea? The fans will be covered by a canopy, and I'm sure there will be warming areas inside the venue. This is exactly what we should have done here in the Twin Cities. They're going to have tailgating, too. Wow. Remember that? You've got to be a Viking fan from the 70s and 60s to remember tailgating. <laughs> a lost art here in Minnesota. Buffalo did it right. The commissioner, Roger Goodell, grew up near Buffalo. I hope he gives that city a Super Bowl. They deserve it, and I'm so happy they're going to be playing those snow games in Buffalo. Wow, you're a Roger Goodell fan now. Not really, but if he brings one to Buffalo, maybe I will be. And on that note, let's FedEx out our thank yous. Alex Yambrick, David Weld, Caleb Truex. For Wally, I'm Eric saying so long. This is 10K Takes, your sports ticket.